Now we have a microphone, that's even better. Good evening. I want to welcome each and every one of you this evening. We are so honored by your presence and so pleased that you've been able to join us for this showcase event tonight. We're excited to talk about the future of legal education because we believe so much in the future of law and legal education in India. And on behalf of the Law School Mission Council, we want to thank all of you for your commitment to law and legal education. We believe so much that law is incredibly important for the future of democracy, for the future of the common good. And so in joining with you in this common cause, we particularly appreciate that you are here and with us for this event. It's my honor tonight to, as we begin, to introduce a professor who in some ways in India needs very little introduction. Professor David Wilkins from Harvard Law School has done so much to study this. Let's thank you. <laughs> and we are honored to work with him in bringing this conference forward this year. And at this time, I would, with great honor, ask him to join me here and ask you again to welcome Professor David Wilkins from Harvard Law School. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, it is a, a terrific honor to be back here in India, to be back at this beautiful setting, and to be back with so many friends. As I've said to a few of you, uh, I, I have the presumption of, of feeling almost Indian being here so many times with you. And one of my uh, favorite traditions in India, of which there are so many, is the lighting of the lamp before every important occasion. And I would like to invite our honored and featured guest, Justice Nariman, uh, and please to come up. <laughs> Professor Menon, who is, of course, the father of Indian legal education, uh, and uh, for President Testi, come with me, uh, please, to light the lamp. I, we can come this way, I think. <laughs> person more appropriate uh, than Professor Menon. Uh, it's almost, Professor is a great honorific, but it is not honorable enough to say uh, about Professor Dr. Menon, who is truly uh, the father of modern legal education here in India, who has set the tone uh, for everything that uh, we have tried to do and we have tried to study. He was here with us when I first came in this room and we first introduced this project, uh, he has given us his blessing. He has introduced us to so many uh, important people and he has inspired us uh, through his work and his example and his presence. And it is such an honor for all of us here to have Professor Menon come to the stage and open with a few remarks of this conference. Thank you. Professor Wilkins, fellow teachers from the United States, my own colleagues in the legal education field in India, Honorable Justice Rohinder Nariman, Ms. Ali Nariman, distinguished lawyers, invitees, ladies and gentlemen. Any discussion on the legal profession cannot be complete without a discussion on the state of the legal education. Unfortunately, this truth has not been acknowledged by the Indian legal profession, 
who have neglected legal education for law and left it to the bar council, the regulators, to shape it up. But Professor Wilkins and his team, having done a project on the legal profession in India a few years ago, have now come forward to join colleagues in India to look at the state of legal education and plan for the future. And this association certainly will be helpful for uh, a country like India, which is wanting to be in the forefront of the leading law schools in the world in the 21st century. With 1,500 law schools and nearly 200,000 law students, the Indian legal education is a multi-million dollar industry. Looking for change in different aspects of both the structure, the organization, the method, and things like that. The Madras High Court, three years ago, have brought out a very important judgment which is still pending in the Supreme Court, wherein it is said that the first reform that is to happen to improve the quality of professional legal education is to distinguish it from general legal education, which a democratic country and a rule of law has to have. Unfortunately, that suggestion from the Madras High Court has not been seriously taken up by the Bar Council of India, and nothing has happened since then. Well, uh, theoretically, we are not indifferent to reform of legal education, nor are we lacking in ideas how to go about implementing the reform agenda. In fact, in the last two months, we have had three national level conferences on legal education. The first one was on 1st and 2nd September this year and was sponsored by no other than the Supreme Court of India. All the vice chancellors of the national law universities were called and uh, the discussion was around as to how to go about the second generation reforms in legal education and what role the national law university should be taking to lead that reform. Soon afterwards, uh, Rajkumar at Jindal had organized a, con a, a consultation meeting of deans and vice chancellors to look at the current challenges to legal education and the prospects for reform in the near future. Finally, I know Nirma University School of Law in Ahmedabad has organized a discussion around an innovative clinical curriculum. The objective of that conference was how to get law graduates practice ready. It was not merely a conference, but it was an action-oriented uh, meeting which has taken off and uh, made it quite relevant in the contemporary times. I mentioned these developments in the recent past to report that while concern for reform is widespread in this country, Nothing much is happening on the ground, uh, either from the government side or from the side of the regulators. Unfortunately, the leadership of the profession is not also taking any initiative to move the policy makers to act on recommendations made by several committees appointed by the government itself. We recall the report of the National Knowledge Commission in 2005 and later the Law Commission of India and several other committees of the government which made solid recommendations for restructuring legal education for the 21st century. I understand that a new education policy is about to be released by the government of India which has a chapter on legal education. It gives some hope that a new framework will be available with the blessings of the government of India for building law schools for the future. It is in this context, ladies and gentlemen, this conference assumes significance. Importance of quality legal education in economic development is acknowledged 
by not only the profession but by the government also when the five year graduates passing out during the 1990s and later have joined the economic reconstruction and nation building activities which proved to be of great advantage to all. The linkages between research and reform or legal development or law reform have not been fully appreciated because law schools have not shown adequate interest in taking up cutting-edge cutting research as yet. The neglect of faculty development is one great roadblock in reforming legal education. Today I understand most of the national law schools and leading law schools outside the national law universities have a 40% deficit in their faculty, particularly in senior positions. Even to become vice chancellors of national universities, we find shortage of competent people. Finally, the regulatory structure is crying for reform. It has not been reformed since 1960s. And fundamental ch changes uh, have to happen in the regulatory structure if we want to build the law school re relevant for the 21st century. I am glad that this conference, sponsored by Wilkins and his colleagues, along with Rajkumar and other friends from India, uh, on all these issues which are highlighted here about faculty development, curriculum reform, uh, restructuring of the regulatory system, these will help us to build uh, the law school of the 21st century and we would be able to compete with Harvard uh, in the 21st century itself. Uh, Professor Wilkins and his team at the Harvard Law School Center on Legal Profession, uh, I thank him for giving me the honor to inaugurate this important conference and make these few introductory remarks. Thank you. Well, as we all know, uh, Professor Menon, uh, we all at Harvard and the rest of the world seek to emulate your example. Uh, I'm also proud to say that there are many graduates of both your national law schools that you began and the one I'm proud to be a professor in uh, here, including our keynote speaker who I will introduce in a, in a moment. Uh, but for now, I'd like to, uh, could you guys put the PowerPoint up please? Uh, say a, a few words uh, about what, what has brought us here together in this wonderful partnership with the Law School Admissions Council. And again, uh, President Tessy, we're so honored that you made the trip here uh, and with so many of your team uh, because you, as we, recognize uh, that this is one of the most important places in the world to be. And uh, it's been my honor now to have been coming here regularly now for several years and uh, even in that time, I have seen an incredible flourishing here in India. Uh, but I also know that India is entering a new phase uh, in its interface with the world. Uh, and that requires the legal profession to enter that new phase. And as Professor Menon just said, that requires legal education to enter a new phase as well. And so I'd like to just say a few remarks on, on what we've been seeing, not just here in India, but around the world, uh, as a way to set the stage for the exciting keynote address and terrific panel that we have for you uh, this evening. So I start with this question, which we hear a lot these days. You know, is legal education in crises? Uh, and I want my, my friends, all of you from India, to know this is not just a question being asked in India. Uh, this is a question that's really being asked all over the world. Uh, and, and there's kind of a, a debate with two sides. Uh, on the one hand, uh, people are arguing that legal practice and the legal profession has changed so much around the world that we need really a radical restructuring or rethinking of legal education. 
Uh, whereas other people are saying, of course we need reform, but we really just need to, to make minor adjustments to a process that after all has worked for, uh, in this country for over a century and for mine as well. Uh, I, I think there's truth in both. On the one hand, there have been truly dramatic changes in the way law is practiced. Uh, and we'll talk about some of those both today and for those of you who I hope can join us tomorrow when we have a chance to go even in more depth on these topics. Uh, changes in the size and the structure of legal professions and the introduction of technology and globalization uh, in balancing between professional and commercial norms. There's so many changes that have happened. Of course, that does call for us to rethink the way in which we train and develop our lawyers. But on the other hand, there are core values and commitments uh, about tradition and stability that are core and essential to what we after all, call the rule of law, which is, after all, the fundamental ideal that lawyers should serve. And, and as I look at the distinguished Fali Nariman in the front row here, I cannot think that anyone has served those ideals better than you, sir, and understand the importance of maintaining those ideals, no matter what changes that we see in the world. So any viable proposal for thinking about the future of legal education has to keep both these things in mind. It has to adapt to the changing world, but it also has to keep central the core ideals of our professions. Uh, we've seen a lot of responses to these tensions around the world. So I'll just start with a few things in my own country. Uh, as most of you know, law in the United States is a postgraduate discipline, unlike it is here in India, meaning the students have a kind of four-year liberal arts uh, uh, bachelor degree. It could be in liberal arts, it could be in the sciences, it could be in engineering, and then they go to law school. And typically law school has been for three years. But many people have argued, no, we should do law school in a shorter period of time to reduce the amount of time that students are in school. So Northwestern University, for example, a very fine institution uh, in the Midwest here where my friend Vikram Khanna, who you'll hear from, who was at the University of Michigan, uh, they've gone to a two-year law school. Uh, or there's a law school in the US called William and Mary, another very fine law school. They've taken their whole third year and turned it into all clinical or simulated programs, meaning no regular classroom uh, instruction. Uh, on the other hand, Yale, I, I've sort of heard of that school. It's a small school in Connecticut. No, it's just a joke. A very, very fine uh, legal institution as well. Uh, they've created a PhD in law, which didn't actually exist in the United States before. Uh, we've seen a proliferation of online, part-time, for-profit, certificate programs. So there's been a huge response in the United States to this challenge of thinking about the future of legal education. Uh, in countries that many of you here are familiar with, the response has in some ways been even more dramatic. So in both Japan and Korea, law was an undergraduate uh, uh, major, just as it is here in India. Uh, but there's been a huge move to move from undergraduate to postgraduate legal education. Uh, most dramatically in Korea, where they basically have eliminated all of the undergraduate law programs and replaced them with postgraduate programs. In Japan, there's a kind of hybrid system in which there's both undergraduate and postgraduate legal education. Uh, Professor Menon mentioned the enormous number of law schools here, 1,500, I think you said, or 1,600. Uh, there are similar numbers in countries like China and Brazil, countries of similar size uh, uh, to India. Uh, but in, me in those countries, there are proposals to, quite frankly, close down many law schools. Uh, they haven't been implemented yet, but they're being debated. And 
I know here in India there have been proposals that have been put forward to do the same here. Uh, we've also seen a big growth in private legal education. Um, the U.S. used to be unique in the sense that we had both private and public law schools. Most countries in the world had only public law schools. But now, in many places, we've seen the growth of private law schools, often with an expressly global focus. So there's something uh, called the Peking School of Transnational Law, which is a part of Beida, or Peking University, in Shenzhen, China. Busarius in Germany, Bukoni in Italy, and of course uh, the great Rajkabar school here, which has had such an important impact, the OP Jindal a Global University, of which the School of Law was its first school. Um, and finally, we see everywhere a big growth in what we call in the United States executive education, or these are programs after people graduate from whatever law school they graduate from uh, that are meant for lawyers to come back. Sometimes they're online, sometimes they are uh, for an intensive week, sometimes people come back periodically uh, over the course of several weeks. Uh, sometimes they're done internally by companies, so the major uh, uh, big four accounting firms have their own universities where they do a substantial amount of training. Uh, and we at Harvard Law School have participated in this, and I, as I look out of this terrific audience, I see some people who have come for our courses that we teach, at, that I started at Harvard Law School, one's called Leadership in Law Firms, another's called Leadership in Corporate Counsel, uh, and here in India, Rainmaker has been running a variety of courses. And finally, of course, we see a very large number of students traveling abroad to get further legal education, often with an LLM degree, but we at Harvard Law School are seeing an increasing number of students from India, from China, from other countries who are coming after their law degree at home for a full three-year JD degree in the United States. So just again, to give you some sense, there's a huge amount of, of change that's happening or experimentation that's happening in this area. And these changes are being driven in part by a kind of debate that's going on in, le in the legal academy about the relative importance of theory versus practice. So we see two kinds of calls for reform. Uh, one call is to make law school more practical, to train lawyers to be ready, sometimes it's said, to hit the ground running or to be practice ready from day one. On the other hand, we hear another kind of call which says, no, what, law, legal education is too narrow today. It's too focused on today's practical skills and what we really need to do is to teach law students how to think more broadly, not just about law, but about the intersection of law and other fields of knowledge. It might be economics, or it might be business, or it might be increasingly uh, computer science or information technology. My sense is both of these calls for reform make important points, but like many dichotomies, they, they separate the world too much in a world that should be more integrated. So in my own view, we need theory, but in some ways we need a better theory of practice. What is practice in the 21st century? What are the, what's the theory of the idea of what we're training lawyers to do? That should inform how we teach lawyers. At the same time, any theory that we have, we should interrogate by practice meaning that theory ought to hold up in the real world as we tested against our knowledge of the way that world works, backed up by empirical data. That theory of practice and testing practice by theory is especially critical today as we look at some of the big changes that are happening all around the world in legal practice. And I'll just kind of briefly identify five. 
first. Most lawyers, until very recently, were solo or small firm practitioners. That's still true, of course, of many lawyers, including here in India, including in my own country. But there are more and more lawyers who work inside organizations of increasing size and importance. Of course, the most obvious is law firms. Uh, the law firms here, which we studied in our book, which started out maybe with 10 or 20 lawyers, now have 500, 600, or seven lawyers. But it's also true of in-house legal departments. It's also true of government law offices. It's also true of NGOs or public service or public interest organizations. More and more lawyers practice law inside an organization. And yet everything that we teach and think about in law assumes lawyers are solo practitioners. Second, law has gone from one of the more homogeneous professions, where most everybody was the same, to one of increasing diversity. The most important form of diversity, which is evident as I look out on this room, is the number of women who have entered the legal profession. In fact, law has become what the sociologists would call a, quote, feminized profession, which simply just means the majority of entrants to the profession are women. Uh, in our country, as Kelly will say, it's about 50-50 uh, men and women. But here in India, it's much a higher percentage of women, and that's true in many places around the world. And yet, the career path in law is not just made for a man, it's made for a man who has a wife who doesn't work. And there are not that many of those around anywhere in the world in dual career families. Third, law used to be a very restrictive market. There weren't that many lawyers, and there certainly weren't that many law firms, and lawyers only practiced in their local jurisdiction, and there wasn't a huge amount of competition among lawyers. Now, Law has become one of the most competitive fields. And yet we don't teach students very much about how to balance that competition with their professional norms. And that's because we still talk about the norms of the profession as if they were kind of in that artisanal guild way in which you know, only lawyers decided what lawyers did and how lawyers were evaluated and clients listened to lawyers and lawyers didn't have to listen much to clients and the government didn't have much to say to about it. All of that has changed. It's become a very competitive business in which if you don't understand how to run a business, you won't be in the business of law very long. And that's a very important point. Law used to be the most local of businesses. If you were a lawyer in Delhi, you probably never went to, to Haryana or Sonipat, you know? You stayed put in Delhi. Now we have lawyers not only who practice in Mumbai, uh, Mumbai and Delhi and, and uh, Bangalore and Kerala and Calcutta, but also in Singapore and Hong Kong and uh, London and New York. It's become a global business and yet, the regulation of the legal profession is still local, is still controlled by bar councils and other organizations which have uh, a national and sometimes even smaller than national scope. Uh, hence this funny word here, uh, glocal, which is just global and local put together, which makes law even more complicated today. This is especially true in a country like India which has achieved unprecedented growth in recent years to emerge as one of the most important countries. Uh, and like its counterparts in what we sometimes call the BRICS, you know, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, uh, China, South Africa, this all happened around the early 1990s here in India with the balance of payment crisis and the opening up of India to the world, more or less. It's not completely open, but more or less open. And that produced two big changes here in India. A huge increase in foreign direct investment and the privatization of some, though certainly not all state-owned enterprises. That then created a huge demand 
for new laws of all kind. You needed an investment law, a trade law, a securities law, anti-competition law. You needed all kinds of law that didn't exist before. And that, in turn, created a demand for new lawyers, or at least lawyers with new kinds of skills who could operate in this new environment and interface between the domestic Indian environment and the global economy. And this, of course, has put pressure on the law schools, even the great national law schools that Professor Menon created to try to adapt to this new reality that Indian lawyers face. We know this is happening, but when we started this project, there was very little systematic research on these ideas because law professors who, as Professor Menon said, there's always been a gap in what the faculty development has been here, but traditionally law professors have studied law. <laughs> they haven't studied lawyers or the legal profession or the market for legal services. And that has restricted how legal education can respond because it hasn't studied the problem. The project we started, which we called Globalization Lawyers in Emerging Economies, or we call it GLEE for short. Uh, some of the young people will recognize that's the name of a popular television show in the United States about a singing organization. I don't sing and I don't wear a tracksuit, but I do, some of the people got that joke, uh, but I do study how is law, globalization reforming the legal profession in important emerging economies, and we started right here in India because I thought it was the most important of all. It's a multidisciplinary research project uh, with multi-institutions, including many partners who are in this room, starting uh, principally with Raj Kumar, without whom we could not have done this project, designed to create what we didn't have before, systematic, unbiased research about the legal profession. And we've involved more than 50 researchers, I'm proud to say many of whom are in this very room, studying all sectors of the legal profession uh, including law, the growth of law firms, uh, in-house legal departments, legal education, regulation, public interest, capacity building uh, to interface with the institutions of global governance like the WTO, uh, and of course, legal education as a pivotal part of the legal profession. We started in India, Brazil, and China, and we're moving the project to Africa, and our goal is to start a conversation among academics, practitioners, policymakers, the judiciary, about how we should be preparing lawyers to live and work in the 21st century. Uh, as I said, we started in India, where we published a slim 972-page uh, book, uh, which I'm proud to say is on sale out there, which we would love to have all of you uh, buy. We actually fought hard to make sure that it was published in India at a reasonable price, unlike what it sells for in the United States. Uh, but that captures what we've learned so far. We then published a book on Brazil, which just came out uh, a few months ago, and our book in China is due out soon. Uh, let me just say a few words about what we found. This is hard to read, so I'll just tell you what it says. We have 22 chapters, 22 chapters, uh, all original empirical research about the Indian legal profession. And four of these talk about legal education. Uh, the first, which is called Responding to the Market, the Impact of the Rise of the Corporate Law Firms on Elite Legal Education in India, by Jonathan Gingrich and Nick Robinson, looks at the national law schools that Professor Menon created and how the rise of the corporate sector has affected who comes to law school, the prestige of law as a post as a grad as a undergraduate degree, uh, how it is shaping not just the national law schools but historically prominent law schools like Delhi University, for example, and the new private law schools like. Jindal. Uh, the second chapter is called The Anatomy of Legal Recruitment, tracking the tra tra sorry, Tracing the Tracks of Globalization 
by Jonathan Gingrich, Vikram Aditya Khanna, and Aditya Singh. And it talks about how this ingenious thing that uh, students came up with to actually interface in the recruiting market between uh, the new law firms and legal departments and law schools. Uh, it is actually one of the best examples of Jugard I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, the third chapter, I see I did learn something all my time here in India. Uh, it's called The Making of Legal Elites and the Idea of Justice by Professor Shamnad Bashir and his co-authors is about a just pioneering effort to try to make sure that India's top law schools are open and inclusive to a broad range of students. And uh, Professor Bashir will be here with us uh, tomorrow and he is, in my mind, a, a legend for what he has created. And finally, we have a chapter called Experiments in Legal Education in India, Jindal Global Law School and Private Nonprofit Legal Education, in which Professor Kumar talks about his journey in creating Jindal Global Law School. So here's the question. We've tried to document where you are so far. The question is, what's next, right? You're entering a new phase, which both has challenges, but also, I think, significant opportunities. And here are some of the issues I hope we talk about here today and tomorrow for those of you who can come. First, how to continue to attract the best and the brightest students to apply to law school. And you know, we're not all going to be computers anytime soon. We need the best and the brightest people. How to select those students for admission in a way that guarantees both excellence, but also equality of opportunity for all Indians. How to ensure that every Indian law school, every Indian law school, Professor Menon, provides a quality legal education. How to update the regulation of legal education and the law school curricula to reflect the tremendous changes taking place in legal practice in India and around the world, while still maintaining the core values that have always been central to the Indian legal profession and the country's commitment to the rule of law. And finally, how to plan for even greater changes that are bound to happen soon, such as the increased liberalization of the legal marketplace and globalization to artificial intelligence and machine learning to online dispute resolution. It will never put Justice Nariman out of business, but we all know online dispute resolution is coming and multidisciplinary practice that are all destined to reshape the legal profession in the future. I'm very lucky because I get to ask the questions, but now I have an amazing group of people who are going to answer those questions for you, beginning uh, with Justice Rohit Nariman, uh, who I am proud to say, as I, I wrote to him in the book that I was honored to give him, is not just a, an honored and favored son of India, but also an honored and favored son of Harvard Law School. Uh, absolutely. And uh, he will open our program by giving us his unique insights from the judiciary in a keynote address. Uh, the, we then will be followed immediately by uh, a terrific panel reflecting on the critical role of legal education in India and building the future uh, legal profession. That panel will include C. Raj Kumar, who needs no introduction and who uh, I know everyone here knows, Rajiv Luthra, one of the greatest lawyers in this country and who has been uh, one of the best friends I've had the pleasure of making in my later life here in my time in India uh, and who is essential to everything that we've done on this project. Uh, Kapil Sibyl, who I hope will be able to join us, but who may be tied up with much of the business that, as you know, he often is involved in. Uh, and Dipali Talwar, who is the Group General Counsel of Tata Steel and also a proud Harvard Law School graduate, or at least we're proud of her. And Kelly Testi, who you've already met, is the President and CEO of the Law School Admissions Council. And this panel will be moderated by really the single most important person for this project, which is uh, Vikram Aditya Khanna, a professor of University of Michigan Law School, uh, but more importantly, the, one of the leading scholars anywhere in the world about India. And 
a dear, dear friend who has been my guide throughout my time here and who knows as much about India's history, I promise you, as any professor of history here. So without further ado, please welcome uh, Justice Nariman to the stage and let us begin our program. Mm. Professor Wilkin, our friends from the Harvard Law School, Professor uh, Madhav Menon, the father of, indeed, the father of legal, legal education in India, Professor Khanna, Professor Rajkumar, my beloved parents, ladies and gentlemen. As I entered this hall this evening, Professor Wilkins said to me, there are three generations of Narimans here in this room. So I said, that brings to mind the famous judgment of Justice Holmes in Buck versus Bell, where there was a compulsory sterilization law which he upheld. And he said, three generations of imbeciles is enough. <laughs> I might only say we have beaten Justice Holmes to it. There is a fourth generation as well. I am very proud to say that I belong to the Campus Law Center of Delhi, which has <laughs> produced one third of the judges of the Supreme Court today. It's an amazing number of judges who have come from that center. And let me tell you, we were very fortunate. I joined in the year 1976 after a Bachelor of Commerce course, as Professor Wilkins was pointing out, we had to first do a bachelor course and then do a postgrad degree. But we were very fortunate because we had the aftermath of Professor Arthur Taylor von Meren coming here and the Campus Law Center imbibing a lot from the Harvard Law School. In those days, it was called the case law method, the Socratic method of teaching, etc. And in a major departure from the other law schools of the day, we had a semester system in which we were taught 30 subjects, finally. And each subject toted up for the final grade that you would get in the LLB examination. Now, I must tell you, that the student body of those days was not great. The reason being, it was very easy to get into law college in those days. However, the teachers who were imbued with this new spirit from overseas were by and large excellent. What was equally excellent and of as much importance as the teachers was the curriculum. Why I say this is, it is very important to be taught something which is interesting, as opposed to be taught the subject in all its details. I give you an example. In our contract class, for example, we started off with the famous case of Khalil versus the Kabbalic Smoke Ball Company. Now, I was not taught by Professor Kingsfield because I didn't act in paper chase. I was taught by Professor Mulchan Sharma, who was one of the new young recruits. However you teach that case, the facts themselves are so interesting that that case grips your attention and never leaves you. It has never left me. We were always taught in the contract class to read sections two onwards, which made little sense at the time. But when we were taught this particular case, what was brought to the fore was the fact that you could have an offer, not from an individual to another individual, but an offer made to the entire world. As you know, there was an advertisement. And the facts there were so peculiar until 
one discovered later in life that there was an influenza epidemic before this particular case was tried in which thousands of people were killed in England. With this background, the facts became a little more intelligible because the advertisement was very peculiar. It said, we the carbolic smoke ball company will offer anybody who takes our product and sniffs it for three days or three times a day for two weeks and then does not contract influenza. Most peculiar. Now, apparently Mrs. Carlil sniffed the smoke ball for over two weeks and yet contracted influenza. And the question was whether this 100 pound offer was actually accepted by her by conduct and whether a contract was formed and whether there was consideration for the contract. Another interesting fact which was pointed out at the time, which didn't exactly strike us as students, but which struck us later, was that a thousand pounds was kept in a bank account, which all the Lord Justices said was to see that we are serious about the offer we are making. So that if persons do come forward and say they contracted influenza, here is the hundred pound from the bank account. The bench consisted of two persons who later became master of the rules, which is the chief of the court of appeals. And all three judges delivered judgment and ultimately held, yes, there was a binding contract. There was an offer. The offer could be made to the world. There was acceptance by conduct. There was consideration for the reason that the person actually inhaled the carbolic acid and by inhaling that acid ultimately caused benefit to the company because they had to purchase the equipment which costed 10 shillings in those days. So finally all the elements of contract were laid down and we were taught this case of course by a professor who was young and who was most enthusiastic at the time. But why I am laboring on this case is that a curriculum should be so designed as to have cases like Carlin. It's not important what you teach, but how you teach it. Because what you teach is forgotten. How you teach it never goes. And once you kindle that interest in a student, the student will not only go and reread ultimately what you have taught it or taught him but will further go on and perhaps expand his reading into areas which he would never have. So the idea really of a curriculum which is very very important is that you have cases which catch your interest so that however average the teacher ultimately the case makes up for it or for him. Another interesting case that comes to mind, which again was taught in the contract class, was Bhagwan Das Kedia's case. Now, that is another judgment where there were two views, and this is one other very interesting and important method of teaching a law student, that look, there are two views, perhaps there can be a third view, and you can come out with it, so it stimulates interest again. Here again we had Section 4 of our 1872 Contract Act, which came up for consideration by the court. Incidentally, our Contract Act was based, apart from being based on the English common law, was based on Dudley Field's draft New York Code of 1860. As you all know, Dudley Field was an outstanding attorney who made drafts of various codes, including a criminal code, civil code, etc. Now, the civil code consisted of sections which were property, contract, etc. And we picked up a lot from that code, including section 4. Field belonged to a remarkable family because his younger brother, Stephen Field, became a justice of the United States Supreme Court. He was the only justice who was the 10th justice of the United States Supreme Court, appointed by President Lincoln. 
Otherwise, you've had nine or less than nine, but never ten. Congress at that point apparently had a tenth seat available. He was peculiar in two other things as well. Apart from the famous shooting incident with another judge, and uh, ultimately the other judge got killed by his Batman, but that apart, he served for the longest period until Justice Douglas broke his record. And there was an interesting story told about him, that when he was old and pretty senile, the first John Marshall Harlan went to him and tried to tell him that, look, you, perhaps you should step down. And this is something that you told Justice Greyer years and years ago. So the old man looked at him, scowled, and said, yeah, and I never did a dirtier day's work in my life. <laughs> and that was that. So the result was Stephen Field continued until he beat John Marshall's record and became the longest serving justice at the time, beaten only by Justice Douglas years and years later. Now coming back to our Bhagwan Das Kedia's judgment, section four of our act states that an offer is accepted when it is put in the post to an acceptor who is an individual and said to be accepted when it is put into the course of transmission so as to be out of his power to retract it. And the question which arose there was as to whether the section would apply even in the case of a contract made over the telephone. And the argument made was that a telephone is a means of instantaneous communication. There is no third party agency once you are put on the line. Unlike a letter being put into the post and the post office is considered the agent of the offerer because he's put it into the post and as that agent now is the collection agent, the contract obviously becomes complete at the time that the acceptor puts it into the course of transmission back to the proposer. And the question was which court would therefore have jurisdiction. The court at Ahmedabad where the offer in that sense was received and assented to or the court at a place called Khamgao where the thing was put into transmission by the acceptor. And by a two-to-one judgment, it was held that the section would not apply to contracts which are not by post. Justice Hidayatullah dissented, went into the law in all the other nations in great detail and ultimately said that this is a section of 1872 vintage. Parliament has not thought fit to amend it. Parliament therefore knows that the telephone has come up meanwhile and not thought it fit to amend it. The section is not limited to contracts by post and therefore, sorry, it is Khamgao which has jurisdiction and not Ahmedabad. Now, it is cases like this which again stimulate your interest. So what is important in setting down a curriculum is to have cases of the kind of Carlil which have peculiar facts which bring out the law or Judgments which have more than one point of view, which again, therefore, lead to the person getting interested in what you are saying and then going and studying for himself. This is one very important suggestion I wish to make, that just as the student body and the teacher teaching are important, the curriculum is equally important and needs to be laid down by persons of the eminence of Professor Madhav Menon. So it is not merely the subject that you are speaking about. There are so many new subjects which you adverted to. New subjects will keep coming in. The point is how do you hold the interest of the student in whichever subject you are teaching so that ultimately when he graduates from law school, he is much more learned in the, in the real sense than another student who has merely parroted something for an examination, walked out and forgotten everything. So this is one suggestion which I may make from my own experience in this great campus law center. 
to come to my experience now in the Harvard Law School. When I joined Harvard, I wished to and did, in fact, major in U.S. constitutional law. So what I did was I took a course with Richard Parker in general constitutional law. I took a course with Tony Lewis in Constitution and the Press and a course with Derek Bell in Constitution and Minority Issues. And apart from these courses, I did my paper which had two credits which Arch with Archibald Cox. Now, Archibald Cox, as all of you know, was the Solicitor General of Kennedy and the special Watergate prosecutor of Nixon who got fired because he was doing his job. The old man was deaf in one year. So I had to always sit on one particular side, otherwise he couldn't hear me. And the subject I chose for my paper was how India treated its downtrodden, that is the untouchable, as opposed to how the US treated the black through case law. Now, inevitably, I was much more interested in the American side. Professor Cox was interested in our side. So he was trying to learn from me, and I was desperate to learn the other side. So every time we met, he would ask me about the latest case law in India. And I would try and discuss Dred Scott with him, or Plessy versus Ferguson with him. Eh, you're not interested. So I was pretty much left on my own when it came to the US Constitution in that area. But again, your history fascinated me so much that much after Harvard, I've kept up with reading of US case law and, the, and your Constitution. And it wasn't at Harvard that I learned that you actually had slavery provisions in the Constitution. That's something that I didn't know and that I picked up only much later, reading around the subject. Now, Chief Justice Taney, who decided Dred Scott, had a Parsi connection. I don't know if any of you know this. Chief Justice Taney had a brother-in-law who was Francis Scott Keyes. Francis Scott Keyes composed Star Spangled Banner. Where did he compose Star Spangled Banner? on a Parsi ship, the HMS Minden. Now, it was built by the master builders, the Wadia builders in Surat, and was parked in Chesapeake Bay during the Anglo-American War of 1812. And this man went to negotiate some kind of a truce with the British, went on board the ship, had this fabulous visitation, composed the anthem and came down the next day. But getting back to Chief Justice Taney, who was much vilified because of Dred Scott, on reading the, these slavery provisions in the Constitution, I, I am not at all sure that he was wrong. You see, you had in the original Constitution, article, and as you know, your Constitution is beautiful in its simplicity. There are only seven articles, and each one deals with a specified subject. Now, Article 1, which deals with Congress, first deals with the House of Representatives, the lower house. And in Article 1, subclause 2, subclause 3, you have a very peculiar provision when it comes to the state's representation in the House of Representatives, together with taxes that are apportioned by Congress to the states. And here, something very peculiar happened. The southern states who had slavery wanted to count the Negro. Because if they counted the Negro as among, among the persons to be counted, their representation in the House of Representatives went up. And the amount of taxes that they got also went up. So the compromise that was reached was very, very peculiar. The Negro is regarded as three-fifths of a person. So you have, therefore, and you count for this purpose, every free man as one. The important thing is the expression free man as one. And all others as three-fifths. 
So this is one indicator that the federal constitution did not consider the Negro as equivalent to a free man, first. Second, equally in Article 1, the same article, subclause 9, for 20 years, the slave trade was something that was allowed. So that when you had, and of course it was masked by using the word labor. So you may have immigrant or immigrant labor, which is nothing but slaves being brought in for a period of 20 years after which it would stop. And third, under Article 4 again, subclause 2, again, little 3. If a slave ran away, it was, it's called the fugitive clause, ran away from state A to state B, his master could get him back to state A. Now, if you read these provisions together, and then you read the Missouri Compromise, which was struck down in Dred Scott, you would probably say it's correctly struck down. And Justice Curtis, who was there for a very short period, who dissented, basically dissented on a ground which didn't involve the US Constitution at all. He said that you had states among the 13 states who treated the Negro as a citizen and also gave him, in some states, the right to vote. If this were so, then obviously it is something which shows that America treated the Negro as a free citizen, as a person who's, who could be a citizen, who is a citizen in some states, and who also had the right to vote. But that was hardly the question. Question was, how did the federal constitution treat this man? So, in hindsight, now that my interest was kindled and I saw these provisions and then reread Dred Scott, I am not at all sure that just Chief Justice Taney was wrong in the judgment he gave. Of course, he's been resurrected. And as you know, he followed in the footsteps of the great John Marshall. And the other interesting thing about the great John Marshall and the equally great Earl Warren much later, your two greatest chief justices, is the fact that they both became chief justices by happenstance. Chief Justice Marshall happened to be the Secretary of State of the second president, John Adams, and would have continued as such and then retired as such as the Adams administration came to an end. Had John Jay, the first chief justice, said no to becoming Chief Justice again. He was confirmed by the Senate, mind you, and therefore should have become Chief Justice once again. But then when you look at John Jay's tenure, in six years they decided only four cases, for six years. And in those six years, he spent a year as ambassador to England while being Chief Justice. So it wasn't an office that meant too much in those days. He then stepped down to become governor of New York, which he thought was a higher office than the chief justice. The reverse of Charles Evans Hughes, who was governor of New York, then became chief justice, much, much later. So, it is this great John Marshall, who was appointed by the Adams administration only because Jay did not accept, and because the senior most judge, Patterson, Adams refused to appoint. So this man came in by happenstance, laid down US constitutional law as we know it. All the great decisions are his, starting from Marbury, going on to Fletcher versus Peck, going on to McCulloch and Maryland, going on to Gibbons and Ogden, etc., etc. I don't have time to speak about all of them. So when Tanny comes in, after this great Chief Justice and delivers Red Scott, and as you know, the Civil War was the result, Tanny got extremely vilified. And we then had the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to do away with Red Scott. One other interesting thing that I, my reading gave me, and why I'm telling you all this is because my interest was kindled by taking up all these constitutional law causes, 
together with the paper I had to write for Archibald Cox, which led me to read this and then discover all this for myself. So that finally, I also discovered as a, as a byway that the 14th Amendment was not actually ratified by the necessary number of states. Three-fourths of the states have to ratify a constitutional amendment under Article 5. Ohio and New Jersey, which ratified the 14th Amendment, withdrew their ratifications. As a result of which it would become less than three-fourths. But somehow that didn't ever bother the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court has, since then, acted on the supposition that the 14th Amendment exists and then you have case after case which has applied. Now, as opposed to all this, we started off on a fresh slate. In our constitution, bang, our slavery was abolished straight away. Our 13th Amendment is in Article 17. Second, our 14th Amendment is in Article 14 and Article 21. And of course, as you know, we've gone much further. Because not only do we abolish the kind of slavery that we've had here, which is really untouchability. But we have gone on to see that these people are rehabilitated and not just rehabilitated, but massive affirmative action programs have been given for them in terms of reservation and so forth, both in the legislatures as well as in government service. Now, the idea again of telling you all this is that there was enough interest kindled by our having been taught these courses. And of course, at that point of time, people would ask me, why are you doing these things? It has no direct practical application for you. One of the things Professor Wilkins pointed out here. I am a firm believer that practical, I don't like the word practical. Practical application has very little to do with education. I believe very strongly that you are educated in the real sense of the word only if you have read around your subject and much more than your subject. Because if you have read around your subject and much more than your subject, you will do your own subject far better than anybody else. I am a firm believer in this. So, one of the answers I would give you is damn practicality. I am not interested in practicality. Give persons the kind of education which stimulates them. And stimulus is to be found, as I said earlier, in curriculum, first and foremost. Stimulus is to be found in top class teachers, which is a rarity. Now, unfortunately, these days, I am told that top class teachers are a rarity only because we have not followed what the first law commission told us to do, which is we must have permanent teaching staff. You can't have people on contract. It is only when you have permanent teaching staff who are trainable. And here is where you people come in. Harvard comes in, other universities come in. One suggestion by me is perhaps you should have an academy like the Judicial Academy in Bhopal. You have the same thing for teachers. And you pick up the brightest in each institution, from the highest to the lowest. Now, how do, how do you get to this brightest? You have students evaluate the teacher. And the students can then evaluate a teacher and say, yes, these are our two or three best. Pick them up. Get them trained at these centers. The training can be by persons overseas, by professionals, by judges, by all sorts. And these people can then go and infect their own kind with the correct legal education virus. That is one way out. So we have suggestions, therefore, which are, number one, student body. Today's student body is far better than the student body in my day. You have competitive examinations, which are reasonably difficult. Persons who get into the five-year law school are all, by and large, top-class persons. Maybe we can have similar examinations on a kind of model 
which is followed by universities for other law students, both three years and five years. Maybe that's one other way out. So ultimately, when one looks at the problem as a whole, there are many things that need to be done and all need to be done together. Finally, I would only say this. Robert Benchley was a great humorist. Had was once asked to discuss the fishing problem from the point of view of the great powers. So the answer he gave was, I know nothing whatsoever about the fishing problem from the point of view of the great powers. Therefore, let me discuss the problem from the point of view of the fish. <laughs> I have been doing exactly that all along. I have been discussing this problem from the point of view of an ex-student. I have never been a teacher, unfortunately. Perhaps I will be one after I retire. But a lot needs to be done. I'm sure the panel will give us a lot of interesting suggestions. Thank you all very much.